Okay, um, I'm Kevin. Thank you, Lisa and Outlier, for sponsoring. Uh, I am going to give a talk about the service mesh. That term is super buzzwordy, uh, so hopefully, I'll kind of explain what it is. It's you know encapsulates a lot of things that you're probably already doing, and the overall goal is to make things more resilient in a microservice architecture because um, we're talking about microservices. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I work for a company called Buoyant, and we have an open source project, Linkerd. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it, using it. Um, and it is an open source service mesh, so we'll get to that. Uh, I've been at Buoyant about two years. Before that, I was at Twitter for five years. Twitter has this very well-documented migration that they made off of like a Rails 2.0 app into like a giant Scala microservice architecture, but we didn't call it microservices. I think we called it service-oriented architecture. Um, but in the process, we wrote a really cool RPC library called Finagle, which is uh, JVM only, and Linkerd uses Finagle heavily in order to facilitate communication. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, I'm going to talk will be about three parts. First, we'll talk about um, why you might need a service mesh or why you need resiliency in a distributed system, um, because commun communication is really fundamental. Um, and then talk about sort of how uh, the an arch a microservice architecture built around a service mesh evolved, um, and sort of what the benefits are of using one. And then I'll do a quick demo, hopefully, uh, if it all works out. So, and actually, I'm going to put my clock out so I can keep track here. Um, cool. All right. So we're talking about resilience. That's the definition of resilience. Basically, the idea is in a distributed system, you have to be tolerant to a lot of stress and uh, make sure that the system doesn't collapse under under a lot of weight. Um, and there's a lot of things that can stress the system out. So we'll talk about those and then talk about some mechanisms to deal with that. Uh, so in terms of operational stress, you can have uh, surges in traffic. This is certainly a problem for Twitter, but it's a problem for anybody if you're a, you know, a uh, an e-commerce site, you know, Black Friday is a big day. You have to be ready for variable load, um, and oftentimes that involves kind of dynamic scaling of your app and sort of mechanisms like back pressure to sort of back off when things are not going well. Um, also, hardware failure now in like a microservice distributed system architecture is a it's a big deal. I mean, we sort of have moved away from the model where you used to own all of your own servers and you bought like top of the line. Uh, hardware, and then you made it redundant. You know, had hardware redundancy, and you ran your app on all of these like machines, and you maintain them yourself. Now you're running them in the cloud, and they're on like the cheapest, crappiest servers that Amazon could buy, um, and they're going to fail a lot. And like, it just has to be part of your architecture that you can route around failure and like deal with that type of scenario. Um, and bugs, you know, you'll push bugs in production, you have to protect against that, and then, you know, the, the unexpected, uh, who knows. Um, so there's a lot of strategies that kind of evolved to deal with this. So dynamic orchestration really just means being to adaptively scale based on the amount of load. Uh, you want to make sure you're properly load balancing your traffic and not overwhelming four performing servers. And you have really sane timeouts and retries, and I'll walk through an example of where this like, gets pretty messy. And then circuit breaking, which is basically just being able to short circuit a request that is likely to fail. So if a server is really performing poorly, being able to detect that and then kick it out of the load balancer pool before you send it more traffic. And so that'll improve your success rate overall. Um, and these things are kind of hard to do. Or you know, if you you know, I think the alternative to using something like Linkerd is you write a lot of this stuff yourself, and that that works. But it's sort of a lot of overhead and you know, we're, what we're trying to do with Linkerd is sort of get that to you for free. Um, so let's see. So uh, let's step back real quick and just talk about a microservice architecture, right? So you have now instead of one monolithic app, you have a lot of different services and they rely on each other. They have runtime dependencies where the, you know, the request will come in and hit service A, which calls service B, which calls service C, and all the way back to the chain. And that's, you know, that, sort of that usually evolves from like one 
giant app and then you would implement like a REST API or gRPC or something like that. And that sort of is easy to manage at a small scale, like service A in this diagram can write like a really kick-ass service B client and then service B can have its own like homespun service C client, like really tuned finely to the performance characteristics of each. But like in reality, once you start splitting things up into a bunch of services, you end up with like a bunch of services. Uh, so, th so this is like a, this is sort of popular on the internet, but this was Twitter's architecture in 2013. So basically as soon as we got to the point that we were off of the Rails app, we were like in this world where, actually so in this diagram you can see there's, um, well, the, the green and red lines are inbound and outbound dependencies for just one service in the architecture. And the gray lines are all the other communications among all the other services in the architecture. And at this point, it's probably five times as large or something. I mean, so um, many of these are JVM apps because that's what the Twitter use, but like, or Twitter use, but you can't guarantee as, you know, in a system this large, you can't guarantee a uniform code base. Um, Twitter relied really heavily on libraries, but libraries kind of break down when you have six or seven languages in production. Um, and so, anyway, so you need uh, a better solution. Uh, yeah, so here's an example of like it breaking down, right? Like, let's see, you're just back in the three service architecture and you have a web service calling timelines, users down to the database. And typically, sort of in the classic model, like if I'm the timeline service programmer, I'm going to build my user service client and I'm just going to sort of make up an arbitrary timeout and say, I really expect this request to take 400 milliseconds. And you know what, if it fails, just try one more time and then return. But as you can see in the diagram, that kind of, that really sort of falls apart when you have these cascading timeouts and retries. So like, let's say that the database slows down in this diagram. All of a sudden, the user service is no longer to make its request within its timeout. And it also triples its traffic to the database or double, you know, it, it retries twice. That takes a really long time. The timeline service uh, doubles its traffic. The web service triples its traffic. And all of a sudden, you have a cascade of requests. And you haven't really managed the communication very well. And you're stuck in this um, hell. Uh, it's anyway. So yeah, so clearly we need like a sort of a better approach to to managing communication. So that's how we get to the service mesh, um, which is you know uh, it's an infrastructure layer for managing sort of service communication. Uh, the idea is that what used to be sort of built into your application is now pulled out into a separate process, and that process is responsible for managing service service communication. Um, so let's see, I, I have some examples of what this buys you, but let's, so let's just go through real quick and talk about how we arrived here. So this is the LAMP stack, some of you may remember it. It was great. Um, you would have your Apache front ends, they forwarded to PHP in this case, you know, or whatever, but that was, that was a monolithic app. That app had all of the code needed to serve your website, except for maybe the data, which would pull out of some data store. Um, and you know, this is a good setup, but as teams get larger and, you know, things evolve, like this setup becomes really hard to manage. And I think one of the reasons to move out of this and into like a microservice setup is that like somebody could introduce a bug somewhere within the monolith and that could take down the whole thing. And then the, you have like a site-wide outage and, um, you know, Twitter had this problem to, to the 10th degree. Um, so, you know, the next step from this architecture is like, okay, we're going to like separate concerns here and we're going to have a service that manages, you know, talks to the user's database and a separate service for login and, you know, everything else. And so like break it out into all these services. And so initially in this environment, you can guarantee that all the new services are using the same framework and they all have this like fat client that they use to make their calls and that fat client can do really cool stuff around retries and uh, it can export tracing data and it can expose metrics about RPC calls and it's really great but it's also very language specific and um, it's much harder to replicate that in multiple languages and do it exactly right so then you can end up with different runtime characteristics in different languages um, and everything gets sort of messy. So like an example of this is uh, in maybe sort of before a schedule environment, you might put all your service discovery data in Zookeeper. And Zookeeper is like not the most friendly system to interface with. 
and you might write like a Java Zookeeper client or use a Java Zookeeper client, and like that's not going to work exactly the same as the Ruby client or the you know Python client, and you're going to have to put that in every one of your applications, and you're going to have to basically teach everything in your architecture to talk to Zookeeper, and that's like really a waste of time <laughs> uh, because. It, it just sort of sucks, and it's like part of part of the reality of running multiple services. So, you know, basically from that model of all the service mesh model, and so all right, and here we are now finally to talk about the service mesh. Um, in this case, it's a separate process. It's available locally to your services. So if you're in, if you're on like a bare metal environment, and you're um, you would run one of these per host. If you're in a scheduled environment like Kubernetes, you could run one. Uh, and it, you could run the service mesh as a daemon set, so it's available on every node, and all the pods and Kubernetes can talk to the node network. And whenever any application in your service needs to make a networked call, then it makes the call through the local proxy, the you know the service mesh, and that handles service discovery. And then you know once it it talks to service discovery, it finds all the available instances of whatever service you're trying to communicate with. Uh, and then it load balances the traffic over all the available instances. Um, and if it's a good proxy, it can have more sophisticated load balancing algorithms. Uh, and it also includes circuit breaking and, uh, and also a, a standard level of observability. So now all, all of a sudden you have a universal stats format and you, know, you can suck that up into a system like Prometheus and you get a, like, a lot more resilient operability out of your services by putting them all through this like, common conduit. Um, so let's see, so now we'll talk just a little bit about Linkerd. So Linkerd does this, it's an open source project, you can run it yourself. It uses Finagle, like I said, so it has a lot of these advanced RPC mechanisms. And in a typical appointment, you would run one per node. You can also run it as a sidecar in like a scheduled environment. Um, but yeah, basically like service A on node one wants to talk to service B on node two, well, it, I mean, or just service B at all. It talks to his local Linkerd. Linkerd figures out uh, which of the instances is likely to respond the fastest, and then like forwards the request there, um, and it gives you all sorts of monitoring and control um, over it too. So talk, let's talk about some more features of Linkerd. So obviously reliability is a good one. Um, in terms of reliability, uh, things like circuit breaking and back pressure are really good examples of. Uh, you know, if the system becomes overloaded, then you can short circuit and like defer putting too much load on backend services and wait for them to back off. And same thing, the load balancing works sort of the same way. So Linkerd is a, uh, call it like a layer seven proxy. Basically it means it's protocol aware. So it will route uh, HTTP one and two, gRPC, thrift. So sort of most of your common RPC mechanisms and in that world, it understands, it's not just uh, like TCP IP where it's talking about connections and bytes. This is actually talking about requests and responses. And so if it's an HTTP request and the service responds with like a 500, Linkerd, you can configure Linkerd so that it recognizes that that's a retriable failure and then it can automatically retry on your behalf. And instead of having like a per request retry rate, Linkerd has this idea of retry budgets. So you can say, okay, like, service A talking to service B, at any given point, I only want the number of retries to service B to you know, it go up to 20% of the standard traffic that we're already sending service B. And that may mean that one request can retry like eight or 10 times, and that may still be within your budget, and it may succeed after those if the other ones are failing. But in the event of an incident, you're not overwhelming the, the back end, um, the traffic. So there's a lot of reliability features. But then, the, you know, I, and I would say reliability and resilience was like the point of the talk. Uh, it's really good, but like all these other features are great too. So visibility, like I said, is standard across all your instances. Linkerd will export stats to Prometheus and Influx DB, and you can use StatsD to send it to Datadog. And you basically just get, and every Linkerd instance has a wealth of stats about all the clients that it's building to talk to downstream services. So you will automatically get latency numbers, success rate, uh, number of connections, bytes sent, stuff like that. Um, and then tracing. So we, we hook up to Zipkin, which is like a tracing framework. So basically as requests transit through, they will emit data to an aggregator and then the aggregator can assemble those back up into like a full profile of the request as it passes through all of your services. And that's a good way to track down bottlenecks or inefficiencies. You can figure out if calls were made in serial when they should have been made in parallel, um, that kind of thing. 
Um, security is a good one, and we're still working on this in Linkerd. I mean, Linkerd is very secure. It's as secure as HTTP protocol, which is, you know, however secure you want to make it. Uh, but we're working on building in uh, a lot more. Right now, Linkerd will auto encrypt traffic, TLS. It's configurable, but basically in the service mesh layout, you know, where you're going from one node to the other, you have a Linkerd on either end of that connection. So it's sort of local app to local Linkerd to remote Linkerd to remote app. And in that world, the local Linkerd can just up encrypt the connection to the remote Linkerd, send the request, that will decrypt and afford your app, and then the apps don't have to worry about certificate management and security and encrypting like that. Um, so and we're gonna do a lot more here around identity as well, because that's like, so in terms of mutual auth and verifying that your caller is actually who they say they are and your service that you're sending your request to is who they say they are. Um, and then, yeah, flexibility. So another tool that Linkerd gives you is uh, the ability to do dynamic request routing. So you, you could, if you have multiple versions of a service in production, you can set the routing rules in a way to send it, you know, all the traffic to one version, or you can like gradually shift traffic off of that version and into uh, a different version, so that really helps with blue-green deploy deploys. You can do DC failover, so if you know a service is unhealthy in one data center, you can fail like 10% of traffic off of that to a different data center. Um, so yeah, it really helps with like, gives you the flexibility to sort of change routing, and none of that requires a redeploy of any of your applications, because they're all, from the application perspective, it's really simple. So yeah, actually, that's sort of one of the, the big benefits from if you're a developer and you're using Linkerd, it really simplifies your application a lot. Like you can take all of this stuff that I'm talking about out of your application and then you, you know, you're, you just know that there's a process locally that will do this for you and then your apps are more, you know, clean. They just sort of need to know what protocol to speak and then they, they can do it. Um, so anyway, so Linkerd, it's been open source for about 15 months now. It's catching on with, um, this, my CEO made it, made put this in here. But we have a lot of companies using it, including Credit Karma, so. Um, yeah, and it's really growing. The community is a good community. We have a Slack channel, we have a discourse forum. Um, you know, it works really well in lots of different environments. So Kubernetes, DCOS, stuff like that. I guess, so this is my last slide. This is sort of a recap of all the perks. But um, yeah, I can show a quick demo. I think I have just a couple minutes and then take a question or two. Okay. Um, I didn't set up the demo beforehand, so. Let's see. Docker, Docker Compose is my friend, hopefully. Uh, uh, can't. Um, all right, so in this environment, I'm starting Linkerd. Um, I can bump this up, but you don't, we won't need to look at the terminal too much. Um, so, yeah, I'm, so I have uh, basically two services that are composed of five apps each, and these are just simple HTTP apps, uh, or you know, instances. And one of the five instances is running at like a 60% success rate. Um, and all the traffic is being split between the, the two services by Linkerd. Um, and then Linkerd exports its metrics for Prometheus, and then we have a, a Grafana dashboard that displays the metrics. So these are all open source technologies. Uh, and the load generator is in another open source project called Slow Cooker from Buoyant. So that's where we're getting the traffic from. Uh, okay, so let's see uh, what the dashboard looks like if everything started. Maybe. Oh no. Oh. Sorry, one sec. I guess I left this up and running. Do this again. Um, but yeah, so basically in the app, I'm going to show off the circuit breaking scenario. So in this case, where, you know, in a round robin scenario, if you have five instances in your balancing over them and one of them is a 60% success rate, that's going to take you down to about a 94% success rate overall. Um, and, you know, I, Linkerd can do a lot better. Um, 
than that. And so by default, Linkerd applies circuit breaking. The default circuit breaker is five failed requests consecutively, and then it will remove that instance from the load balancer pool. And then it will probe the instance with new traffic uh, on a configurable interval, but once every 10 seconds. And then if, it succeed, if the probe succeeds, then it'll add it back in the pool, but it will continue to monitor it, and then it will eject it again if it, uh, so let's see. Let's see if that worked. Oh my god. Um, well, I don't have a lot of traffic here. Um, one sec. Oh, uh, shoot. All right, this may not work. My Docker machine is 12 minutes behind real time, which would require a full restart of the machine. Um, you know what, I'll, uh, anyway, I think we should skip the demo and I can, um, the demo is available in the Linkerd examples repo. It's up on GitHub, you can check it out, run it yourself. Uh, but yeah, maybe we should just go to questions and I can take any questions folks might have. Yeah. Yeah, so with your local Linkerd, how do they form like consensus? Yeah, so, ser so for service discovery specifically? Yeah. Uh, so service discovery is just pluggable in Linkerd. Linkerd doesn't handle service discovery, but if like if you're running in Kubernetes, then you would configure it to talk to the Kubernetes API, and it uses it just will use the service model that's already in Kubernetes. If you're, you know, if it's Zookeeper, you can plug in Zookeeper, so Zookeeper already maintains consensus of the data. So Linkerd doesn't maintain any state within it, and it just relies on the backend system. So it's, we have support for console and etcd and Zookeeper, uh, Marathon if you're running a DCOS. So we basically just outsource that to whatever system you're running in, and then we'll plug into that service discovery. Awesome, thank you. Linkerd.io, check it out. Um.